Yeah, yeah, anytime. Yeah. Okay. Welcome everybody. We are very excited to have Lee Ying here. Uh, he is a professor in ECS at the University of Michigan, and he studies the interplay of complex stochastic systems and big data, including reinforcement learning, large-scale communication and computing systems for big data processing and private data marketplaces, as well as large graph mining. He's won a number of awards, including the Young Investigator Award from the DTRA, the NSF Career Award, and many, many best paper awards at conferences in different disciplines, including communication networks, computer systems, and data mining. So I'm super excited uh, to, to welcome uh, Leigh here. So Leigh, uh, the, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Yash, and uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, I'm also super excited to have this opportunity to uh, share with you some of my uh, recent work on uh, stochastic networks. So uh, this talk is about uh, using mean field model, stance method, and uh, state space concentration uh, for understanding large scale uh, stochastic system. So uh, let me start with a. Uh, Oh, yeah. So let me start with uh, why we are interested in a uh, large scale stochastic system. Uh, the reason is it's everywhere, right? So if we look at uh, uh, large scale foundational models, uh, we can see uh, these large scale foundational models has billions of parameters. And these models are usually trained with a huge amount of data because the data is so large, we cannot take all the data at once. Uh, to train the algorithm. So what usually happens is you take a small subset of data, you run a stochastic gradient algorithm, and then you run many, many iterations, then the algorithm eventually will converge, the parameter will converge, right? So we can view like these parameters basically forms a large scale stochastic system. And what we try to understand is as the iteration continues, uh, how this parameter evolves over time, where it will converge to, and what's the uh, convergence rate of the training algorithm, what's the generalization error when the, the, the parameters converge to its, uh, its fixed point, right? So this uh, requires us to understand this very large stochastic system. And another example is to support the training of these large scale or uh, foundational models, we need to do all the computation in a large scale data center like cloud computing center, which has uh, like tens of thousands of machines. And uh, to understand the performance uh, of these, uh, these uh, large-scale data centers, let's say, try to understand, for example, the latency in terms of computing, where job continues coming, then we need to allocate these jobs to different servers. Again, we need to use uh, uh, the tools from large-scale uh, stochastic system because we can view each server as, uh, as a, like, I mean, each server has a queue. So it's a system with have lots, lots of queues, right? What we are interested in is uh, when the system reaches a static state, what's the performance of the system? What's the queue length, what's the delay and so on, right? So these are just two examples. There are many other examples like a ride sharing system where have passenger come in, you have the drivers available, how we match the two, right? And we have the internet of things. So we have many, many, many devices are connected to the internet, maybe through wireless. So they share the same spectrum. Then how do we control them, manage them? All these require knowledge of, of understanding a uh, large scale stochastic system, okay? Uh, because this system size is so large, so we often run into the issue of uh, curse of dimensionality, right? Uh, when the system uh, become large, then the state space becomes so large and uh, very quickly it become untrackable. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we also have something called the pricing of dimensionality, which is when the system size becomes so, so large, maybe uh, some approximation can be done, actually give us a way to, to understand system in, in a trackable fashion, okay? So today are, I'm gonna introduce, uh, not introduce, I'm gonna talk about, uh, mainly focus on the mean field analysis, right? Uh, it has been a tool uh, used for a very long time to understand large scale stochastic system. So what I'm gonna talk about is to briefly introduce mean field analysis and the key idea behind that. Uh, then point out what are the limitations of the traditional mean field analysis. Then I will talk about how to use stance method and the mean field approximation, a different view of looking at these uh, mean field analysis uh, to overcome some of those difficulties. Then at the end, 
I will further generalize that and to use state space concentration to make the tool uh, even more powerful. Okay, so that's that's a brief outline. And feel free to stop me uh, anytime if you have any question. Or, uh, you can also po uh, post your question on chat and uh, uh, Yark has kindly uh, uh, agreed to help me. So if you post a question, he can stop me and uh, I can answer the question, okay? So uh, let me start with our mean field analysis, right? So uh, throughout this, uh, this talk, I will use this uh, example, the load balancing example, uh, to talk about mean field analysis and the ideas we have to generalize that, okay? Because this is a very simple example, easy to explain, uh, but it's also a very interesting problem people have been working on for, for a long time, okay? So uh, here the example uh, uh, is a load balancing problem. We have many servers, and each server has a separate queue and a job come in and uh, the load balancer needs to dispatch the job to one of the servers, okay? And we assume all the servers are homogeneous, all the jobs are homogeneous, uh, arrival is for song, service time is exponential with the mean one, okay? And what's the goal here? The goal here is to design a load balancing algorithm such that the delay can be minimized, okay? So as I said, this problem is not new. It has been studied for many, many years. Uh, in theory, what is the best algorithm to use? The best algorithm is uh, join the shortest queue. Basically, when the job comes in, you look at all servers, then uh, put the job in the shortest among all servers, let's say n servers, the shortest of them, right? So that can be uh, proven to uh, achieve the best delay performance under very general uh, conditions. However, uh, it's not what people use in practice. The reason is the overhead of implementing this uh, join shortest queue is, is tremendous, right? Because to do that, let's say if you have 10,000 servers, then you need to check 10,000 servers for each incoming job, find the shortest queue. And next time when another job comes in, you again have to check these 10,000 servers. And then information need to be uh, communicated back to the load balancer. And that overhead itself can kill the performance of the system, right? So in practice, what people do usually is a, a, a simplified version of this uh, join the shortest queue called the power D choices. So instead of look at all servers, we will just pick D servers from these N servers, then uh, send the task to the shortest of these D servers. Right, uh, that has been used in uh, like Google's Borg or Sparrow in Spark, uh, because now we only need to check these servers instead of all n servers, so the overhead become much smaller. Okay, so that question naturally is then, or uh, this is certainly is a weaker version of the uh, join shortest queue. How does this algorithm perform? Right, to understand that, then we need to understand again a large scale stochastic system because we have n queues here. Even for each server, it has finite buffer, let's say size B, uh, then the size of the system, state of the system grows uh, as B plus one or uh, greater to the power N. Okay, so it grows exponentially large as N increases, and uh, soon it's become impossible to, to, uh, under, uh, to analyze, right? So, I mean, I think it's remained to be an open question what's the exact steady state distribution of this uh, N size system? Uh, no one knows uh, even now, okay? But still we want to do something, right? We want to uh, understand the performance. Uh, so one idea is the mean field analysis. So the mean field analysis start with the uh, following uh, uh, chain of thought. Let's say, uh, let's focus on a single queue, right? Single server in this N server system, okay? So if you look at this uh, single server, single queue, uh, it's a simple burst S Markov chain, right? Q length increased by one, when there's arrival and uh, decreases by one if there's a departure, okay? So it's a, it's a simple burst S Markov chain uh, as, as it here. I don't know, uh, can you see my uh, mouse? Yes. Okay, uh, so it's a simple burst S Markov chain, right? And also the, uh, the departure part is very simple. Uh, let's assume uh, it has uh, uh, all the jobs has a service time one, so the departure occurs with rate one, okay? And what is makes things complicated is the arrival part, because now to decide the up transition, uh, it depends on all the states of other queues in the system, right? Because let's say we do power D choices or power two choices, then the probability 
this server will get the job depends on the other selected queue, uh, the queue length, whether the queue length is equal or larger. Uh, if it's larger, then you get a job equal, then you need to break time and so on, okay? And uh, the state of other queues you can you can see is a high dimensional random process, right? So therefore, the uh, transition from i to i plus one depends on a high dimensional random process, which makes the problem impossible to solve. Okay, and uh, one observation <clears throat> you could immediately have is uh, uh, the the index or the identity of the servers in this case is not important. So what determines the up transition, the transition from I to I plus one is actually the distribution of the queue lens in the system, right? So let's say how much queues are uh, non-empty, how many, um, uh, what's a fraction of queues has queue lens greater or equal to one and so on, right? So we can just look at this uh, distribution and to decide what's the transition rate from I to I plus one, okay? But that not make things uh, any better because now actually you go from uh, n dimensional n minus dimensional random process to an infinite dimensional random process because this this s is goes from s zero to s infinity right so yeah not make things better but that's a current representation uh, we can use to decide the uh, like this single server Markov chain okay and the s itself is still a high dimensional random process infinite dimensional random process and the value changes over time and we don't know. Uh, what's uh, what's uh, uh, steady state? It's too complicated to to solve. Okay, so here comes uh, uh, the idea of mean field approximation. Okay, so we know S is uh, high dimensional. It's random. It's uh, nasty to uh, to like calculate. So let's how about just replace that with its mean value. Okay, so just say uh, instead of decide the transition with uh, this high dimensional random process S. I will just replace that with its mean value, little st. Uh, now it's become deterministic, right? When st is given, then I have the transition of this burst test Markov chain decided by some deterministic function instead of stochastic uh, process. Okay, so that's good. Uh, so now still the question is, what s I should use, right? I have no knowledge about the uh, random process. Of course, now I still have no knowledge about its mean, right? So how do I... Uh, like uh, utilize the fact now I can use mean to approximate and make the things uh, trackable. Okay, so here is a very important observation we have is we have actually something called a consistency condition. Uh, if S is actually uh, is the right mean value, okay? So the consistency condition says, if I look at this uh, single server Q, okay, uh, the probability that Q length is larger or equal to I uh, at a steady uh, at, at time t should be the value that the uh, the mean value of the fraction servers has q length greater or equal to i. Okay, so it's very easy to understand because if I tell you uh, for each server the probability that q length greater or equal to ten is one percent. Okay, then I ask you the question in this completely symmetric homogeneous system. What is the uh, uh, fraction Q on average will have Q length greater or equal to 10? Uh, then the answer should be 1% uh, as well. So these two quantities should be consistent with each other. Okay. So that's a great news because now are I able to connect the mean field I have, like the distribution of other Qs on average versus the steady state uh, versus the distribution of the single Q I'm focusing on, right? And uh, what we can do is now we can write uh, this uh, common graph forward equation or here use on the mean field approximation become the mean field model, which describe how the Q lens for this uh, single Q evolves over time uh, based on the distribution of other Qs. And the, the single Qs distribution is described by S and the distribution of other cues, they are mean dis uh, the mean value of that are again described by S as well. Okay, so I have a, a, a differential equation on the left hand side is S, the right hand side is S, and basically give me a dynamical system. Okay, so now I can look at this dynamical system and uh, understand what's the steady state of this dynamical system. For example, or under the power two choices. Uh, we can solve and find out the fixed point of this dynamical system is S star, S star I 
is equal to lambda raised to the power two i minus one. Okay, and uh, what does that further tell us is uh, if we view that S star as a distribution of the Q for for a single server system, then we can calculate the average Q length based on this S star. So recall what is S i? S i is a uh, probability the Q length is greater or equal to i, right? To, cal uh, to calculate the average Q length, we can just, uh, uh, yeah, there's typo here. Uh, you don't need the expect value. You can just uh, sum this uh, SI together. And what you get is average Q length now is log, uh, log of lambda over one minus lambda, okay? So that is under the power two choices. And uh, we can compare that with, uh, uh, for example, random routing, you just pick a job, sent to a, a random server where the Q length is lambda over one minus lambda. So you can see by just adding a little bit of flexibility and let the load balancer just observe or probe two Qs, we can reduce the Q length significantly, right? And uh, this can be uh, uh, like analyzed, understood by using this mean field approach, okay? So the question is, uh, of course, from the beginning, when people use this mean field analysis, is this analysis is make sense or not, right? Is accurate or not, right? So the traditional way to show the mean field analysis actually give us the right answer uh, is the kind of following uh, approach, right? So what we know is, first of all, uh, if the stochastic system is operated under a reasonable algorithm, uh, then that system should have a steady state, right? So for example, the Markov chain should converge to the steady state. So this can be shown, for example, use a fastly up and theorem. And then our, on the other hand, we also have a dynamical system, which is deterministic, represent uh, our approximation of the stochastic system. We can use the uh, Lyapunov theory or Lasalle's invariance principle to, again, to analyze the convergence and the equilibrium of that dynamical system. Let's say it converts to S star, okay? And uh, what we know, like uh, for by following analysis uh, earlier is we know S star, right? We can solve that from the uh, mean field model. And uh, what we want to know uh, is, the, is a steady state. And we want to understand uh, whether the steady state, uh, what the steady state look like. And uh, here, what the mean field analysis suggests is the, uh, the S star will be a good approximation of Sn infinity, okay? But how do we rigorously show that? Uh, the way to, to prove that uh, using the traditional approach is you first fix time t, right? Look at a finite time, and then let n go to infinity. So in that case, you have something called a process level convergence, which can be shown using like, for example, Kurtz theorem. So uh, when t is fixed, when n go to infinity, you basically have a process level law large number, so it will converge to the trajectory of the dynamical system. Then uh, we also can show, like for the dynamical system, if it's stable, it will converge to its unique equilibrium point S star, right? And also, as I mentioned, uh, the uh, with, with the foster lee Upnow theorem, we can also show the Markov chain will converge to its steady state. So what we are able to establish uh, is this one. So what are we able to establish, uh, let's see, is, uh, is this route. So if we let n go to infinity first, uh, then let uh, t, sorry, let, yeah, let n go to infinity first, then uh, the stochastic system converge to the uh, dynamical system. Uh, then if we let t go to infinity, then it converge to the fixed point, right? Uh, but what we really need So what we actually need is not that route. What do we actually need? Uh, yeah. So what do we actually need uh, is to show the steady state actually converge to this S star, okay? So you can see if we compare what we want and what we already have, the difference is the limit is taken uh, over a different order, right? What we can establish is if we let n go to infinity, then let t go to infinity, then it's converged to S star. What we want to show is if we let t go to infinity first, then we have the steady state. Then if we let n go to infinity, then we can show the steady state converge to S star, the mean field limit, right? So the key here therefore is whether 
the limit can be exchanged, right? So if you can show uh, the limit can be exchanged called the interchange limit, then we are able to show the steady state actually converged to S star, then uh, that's an indication the mean field limit is the right limit to use for approximating the steady state of the uh, stochastic system, okay? So that's basically uh, the steps of the proof. You show process level convergence, you show the uh, convergence of the Markov chain, convergence of dynamical system, then you use the interchange limit, which require a non-trivial proof, and to show that's the right limit, okay? So that, that's basically justify why mean field analysis uh, is, is, uh, is the right approach to understand uh, the stochastic system with the large range. Okay, so that, that's the mean field part. I mean, that none of that is my work. That's just uh, the mean field introduction. Okay, uh, how do I get rid of that? Okay, okay uh, any questions so far? No, okay, good. Okay. So now uh, let me talk about the limitation of this uh, traditional uh, mean field analysis. Uh, the first limitation is it is asymptotic uh, result. Asymptotic result, it means uh, we only know when angle to infinity, the steady state actually converge to uh, S star, okay? We actually do not know, uh, for example, the rate of convergence. So uh, we, don't know, uh, we don't know how fast the steady state are gonna converge to this S star. Or in our, our, our stated that in a different way, we do not actually know the approximation error for any finite size system. So if I gave you a system, let's say with size 1,000, uh, I want to know like in that case, uh, what will be the mean square error of using this S star to approximate a steady state? I cannot answer that question because I only know the limit, it will converge, but I don't know how fast it is converging. This is an important question because there, uh, uh, if I know, for example, the rate of convergence is one over n, then uh, I'm pretty confident of using this mean field model uh, for starting a system, let's say n equal to 100, 1,000, I know uh, the error will be small, okay? However, uh, if the rate of convergence uh, turns out to be, let's say, one over log log n, then I know uh, I need to be really, really careful using the mean field uh, limit because uh, for uh, unless n is astronomical or the error will be very, very large, right? So it will not be a good approximation. So therefore, uh, understand this rate of convergence is, is very important uh, for us to like have a confidence of using this mean field model and also help us to quantify the error of using this mean field approximated origin system, okay? But the difficulty here is uh, it will require us to directly bound the difference, right? We need to directly study the difference between the steady state of size n system uh, versus the mean field S star here, right? We cannot use these uh, limiting approach, especially the interchanger limit, uh, which will not give us a rate of convergence. So that's the one limitation of the traditional uh, mean field analysis based on the interchanger limit. Uh, the second uh, limitation, I think it's some sense even more serious than the first one, is uh, by using this traditional uh, mean field limit, right? We are basically using the limiting system, which become a, a dynamical system to approximate the original system, is that approximation is quite rigid. What that mean? Means uh, we have finite size system, right? With size n and we have the mean field limit, which is uh, is a case when n go to infinity. So now to make sure uh, the dynamical system is the right limit, what need to happen is first of all, or like all the parameters have to converge to the right value, right? So if you let, let's say lambda n go to infinity, right? Uh, you have a sequence of a system from one, two, three, and index by n. If you let n go to infinity, then that's lambda n need to go to lambda, that lambda should be the one you use in the mean field uh, system. And same thing, like in the power D choices, if the D is depends on n, again, if you let n go to infinity, uh, you need to use a limiting value uh, for the uh, mean field system. So because that system is a limit, right, of the stochastic system. So all the parameter you use should be the limit uh, of the stochastic system. So it's okay if the system is, let's say, is lightly loaded or the D is a constant, never change, not depends on N. 
but we run into problem uh, if uh, we want to go beyond that. For example, if we want to understand the performance of system uh, for heavy traffic region, where lambda is a function of n, so lambda approach to one as n go to infinity, right? Then what happens? I mean, this is a, a, a get a grade of interest because we want to make the system as efficient as possible. So we want to uh, understand like how efficiently system can be operate when traffic become heavier and heavier. And our second scenario is we also want to make the delay very, very small. We want to achieve like ultra low latency or like even zero uh, waiting and so on. In that case, the, uh, the sampling compressor D has to depend on uh, depend on size of the system as well, right? For example, uh, we may want to choose D equal to log N over one minus lambda, right? To minimize, uh, to make the delay small, right? Close to the joint shortest Q. But in that case, you can see if I let lambda goes to, uh, let, let if I let N go to infinity, then lambda become one. If I let N go to infinity, then DN become infinity. And if I put that into my mean field model, I get a mean field model, which is EO defined, uh, because if you solve that, uh, the solution is uh, S equal to infinity, uh, sorry, S equal to one uh, for every I. So basically the Q length is equal to infinity, right? So that limit is not wrong. That limit is correct because if the system is critically loaded, lambda equals to one. So the, so the arrival equal to the service rate, then the system is not stable and all Qs will blow up. Then S will equal to one for any I, right? So that, that's the correct answer. The problem is uh, it is a useless answer for us because what we try to understand is for finite n, how the system perform, how, for example, the Q length delay scale with n, uh, but the limit tell us everything is unstable, everything to infinity, so it's not very useful for me to understand the finite size system, okay? So uh, here, uh, therefore, uh, we try to overcome this problem and we utilize uh, stance method and mean field approximation to overcome this problem, okay? So what's the idea of a stance method? So uh, of course, stance method has been used uh, in different applications. So for us, we focus on using stance method for the mean field model. And uh, the, the work which uh, like inspi inspired us to look at that uh, is uh, Anton and Jim's paper, 2015 paper. So I want to uh, uh, point this out too. Okay, so the idea is to use stance method uh, to directly bound the steady state of the stochastic system and the uh, mean field limit, okay? So they, it provides uh, 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 two advantages and overcome the two issues I mentioned earlier, okay? So if we can directly bound the difference between the steady state versus limit, first of all, we know the rate of convergence, right? Because now I'm directly bounding the uh, difference. So the difference will be a function of n. So I can see how the error uh, decays as n increases. Or for finite n, I will know the exact uh, approximation error, okay? So that's one advantage. Uh, it will provide a rate of convergence or approximation error. The second advantage, now uh, if I look at this uh, system, what is the goal here? The goal here is to uh, approximate the steady state of the stochastic system with size n with some fixed point of some differential equation, or we call the mean field model, okay? So I'm not care about the limit now. I just want to find the best approximation for my size n system. So what should I do in this case? For example, I, I tell you, I want to construct a, a differential equation or mean field model for my size n system, right? Then what should I do uh, is to have a customized mean field model, which is designed for that size n system. This is important because for example, in the heavy traffic regime, I can use the exact arrival rate for that size n system instead of the limit, which is one. But for size n is a number depends on n, but it's strictly less than one. I can use that as arrival rate for my uh, mean field model. And similarly, I can use exact D value I use for my size n system in my mean field model as well. So my mean field model now is a function of n. It's not a limit. It's, that's why I call it mean field approximation instead of mean field limit, because it's not a limit. It's just an approximation. Use, uh, use ODE, okay? 
and that approximation will be un uh, independent because it's better it's capture all the information I have for a size n system. So now our this model actually is well defined because lambda is less than one and the d I use is finite. I mean it depends on n, but nevertheless lambda is finite and d is d is finite as well. Okay. And uh, by solving that uh, mean field equation, then I get uh, S, which is the Q distribution, depends on N as well, because now my parameter arrival and the sample overhead depends on N. Then I can use that to look at the Q lens to understand how the Q lens scales as uh, lambda incre uh, the, the, the uh, lambda getting close, close to one, and how, uh, how it performs when D become larger and larger, okay? So the advantage is by uh, over uh, by by not using this limit, right? By just directly build a bridge between the uh, stochastic system steady state versus the, the the fixed point of a differential equation, I able to establish the approximation error and also uh, also uh, look at those regime which which is impossible in the traditional mean field analysis. Okay, so now are uh, get into more detail. How do we directly bonding? Uh, the steady state versus the limit, right? Okay, and how stance method work? It's it's a, it's a really really interesting uh, idea. Okay, so uh, let me start with this question. So the question is, uh, I want to calculate this mean square. Okay, and uh, but I don't know the distribution of s, right? Because if I know the distribution of s, that that's that's perfect. That's exactly what I want. My difficulty is I don't know the distribution of this. Uh, S infinity, right? Steady state of the stochastic system. So, without knowing the steady state, how do we calculate this mean if you, uh, the mean square error, right? So, you will immediately come back to me and say, uh, no one can solve that, right? If I ask you to calculate the mean value of a random variable uh, without giving you the distribution of that random variable, that's an impossible problem to solve. Okay, so then I say, okay, okay, I, I forgot some more information I should already uh, give to you is, uh, in addition, uh, I know another function z, which is zero mean, okay? Not only that function is zero mean, uh, actually it's very close to the function or you have in the expectation and the gap is like always close to like epsilon, right? It's always order epsilon. Okay, so now I'll ask you, can you calculate this expected value? And then you will come back to me probably immediately say, okay, now it's, it's very easy because uh, it's epsilon. Why it's epsilon? Because I can subtract this z function uh, from the expectation, inside the expectation. It's zero mean, so then change the, uh, uh, the answer. Uh, but what I get then inside the expectation is almost a constant, right? Because point-wise, the gap is epsilon, so whatever you have inside the expectation is a constant. The expect value of constant is constant itself, so the value is, is epsilon, okay? So basically, uh, by providing this mysterious z function, uh, it make a, a problem which is impossible to trigger, okay? So that, that's, for me, that's the, that's the most interesting part of this stance message. Of course, now, question. How do we get this Z? What the hell is this Z, right? And how do we even get that? So now uh, let's look at now, uh, I mean, of course, uh, if this is just for a general distribution or general stochastic Lee, system. Lee, there's, yeah. a, there's a question in the chat from Janki Murthy. So she says, how do we know the steady state of N of the N particle system converges to the steady state of the custom mean field model? I didn't catch We don't. That. That's a very good question. We don't. And we don't care. What we care is just what we want to just quantify the error. So what we try to show is not the convergence. What we try to show is what you come up with for the mean field model. It may not be the limit, but it's very close to the steady state and I can quantify the error. Okay. Yeah, so that's that's a very good question because I think uh, we should keep that in mind. We are not looking for the limit because uh, in the third, about, uh, third part of this talk, you will see even more bizarre mean field models <laughs> we will use, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, it will help to keep that message in mind. We are not looking for the limit, okay? Uh, any other question? Okay, 
So now, uh, what's the z function? As I mentioned, if s is some just general uh, stochastic system, s star is just come from some, some this random dynamical system, of course, you cannot find a z, right? So z has to come from the fact we are using this mean field model and uh, or mean field approximation. We are confident that the mean field approximation gave you an answer which is close to uh, the statistic. Okay, so that's for, uh, let's step back and look at uh, what mean field approximation we're using. So basically, uh, what mean field approximation we're using, as I mentioned at the beginning, is related to the uh, common graph uh, forward equation. What you are approximating is uh, approximate the dynamic of the uh, stochastic, uh, the, yeah, stochastic system. We, we are not using, instead of viewing that stochastic, we just look at the mean evolution, okay? that we get a dynamical equation or a differential equation. So S star basically capture how in the mean sense, the stochastic system evolves over time. Uh, therefore, what we are calculating is just the conditional expectation of uh, S at time T plus uh, uh, epsilon minus ST. So the evolution of the uh, stochastic system in the mean sense. And we choose epsilon, uh, the parameter uh, epsilon here as one over N and the other side of the system, right? So that's what we have for the mean field approximation. We are hoping this approximation, which is the first order approximation, uh, is good enough for us to understand the stochastic system when n is large enough, okay? Of course, this equation is still very different from the, uh, the first one I want to get. So let me go one step further. So, okay, I know S dot equal to this uh, conditional expectation. So how about if I consider a general value function g here, okay? And look at the evolution of this g under the dynamical system versus the evolution of the g under the stochastic system. Is that two will be close or not for any g or like for any well-defined g, okay? Turns out the answer is also yes, or you can just do a Taylor expansion on the right-hand side and you will find the first term come from a Taylor expansion basically relate that to the mean field model. So the first term uh, is come from the mean field model. Then the uh, the second term basically is approximation error of the first order Taylor expansion, okay? So uh, so you can see on the left-hand side, if a gradient of G on the right-hand side, if a gradient G, then S dot equal to whatever the remaining term in the first term, like one over epsilon times this conditional expectation, right? So S dot will match that and a uh, gradient G match and whatever you have uh, come from the stochastic system is just the error of the first order Taylor expansion, okay? That is order epsilon, okay? So we are getting there now, okay? So let's see now uh, if you can solve the following equation. You can find a G, remember in the previous slide, uh, I didn't define what G we're gonna use. It's, it's a general well-defined G, you'll have that property. So now let's find a G such that the, uh, the norm square is equal to the gradient of G times S dot, okay? The S dot here is a time derivative of the, the S, right? Basically a dynamic system. So let's assume just we can solve that, okay? So if we can solve that, then what we can do is we can uh, then define the mysterious Z function uh, as the group part I have in the second equation, okay? So the equation here, okay? So I define my z to be uh, that one of epsilon uh, times the conditional expectation, right? The drift, what we call it, okay? So what's the property this uh, z function have then? If I take the expected value of uh, this z at a steady state, what you essentially you get is expected value of g s infinity minus g s infinity, right? So it's use iterated uh, expectation. You can see uh, it's just the uh, expected value g minus expected value g, so it's zero mean. Okay, so z function is zero mean. That's one requirement we have when we introduce this z. And the second is a uh, requirement is this z function should be very close to the uh, norm square, right? It's indeed very close because uh, I know the difference is just uh, related to the Haitian of this g and times this uh, parameter epsilon, right? So if epsilon is small, then basically, I mean, oh, sorry, if the Haitian is bounded, then the difference is basically epsilon. Right, so therefore, uh, this mysterious z function is is the one we define here. If we can find the g function, okay. So everything now comes down 
whether we can solve that equation, like the norm square equal to the gradient of g times s dot, uh, that's called a Stein's equation, okay? And uh, we need to solve that. Oh, actually, we don't need to solve that. I mean, we, we need to make sure uh, that equation actually has a solution, okay? And uh, one thing I want to point out is uh, when we look at this equation, everything is deterministic, okay? There's no stochastic here. S dot is a dynamical system, is deterministic. Uh, G function or is, of course, is deterministic. I mean, there's not, no randomness here, okay? And if we, turns out, can show that G exists and we can show the gradient, oh, sorry, Haitian is bounded, then we can directly, then, then we can get to the conclusion. Now the mean square is order epsilon and the constant ahead of the epsilon is, is based on the Haitian, okay? And, uh, our, and the difficulty here is usually uh, solving this Stein's equation is non-trivial, especially if you want to get a closed form expression of G, uh, in most of the cases, impossible, okay? However, if we look at the equation I, uh, uh, in the box, then you realize actually we don't need to actually solve the function of G. What we need is to make sure the Stein's equation has a solution, okay? And if the differential equation uh, has a nice contraction property, uh, property, then in most of the case, actually it's true because another way to view this G function is G function is basically the value function, right? If you look at this S minus S star as a cost function of your dynamical system, what G function turns out to be just integral of this cost function from initial state to the steady state. So it's just a value function. Okay, so if the system has nice uh, stability property, then G function always exist. And with that, then uh, we can use our perturbation theory to uh, bound the Haitian of this G function as well. It turns out our, our G will have a bounded Haitian if uh, the system is locally exponentially stable, uh, which was established in, in my 2016 paper, okay? So now we can just apply that. Everything become uh, straightforward. We can apply that stance method, right? And we, the, what we need is to define the mean field properly based on size n system, then just look at the stability of the mean field model. We don't have to deal, touch the stochastic system at all. Everything is based on the uh, dynamical system. Everything is deterministic. And the conclusion we can get if we look at the uh, light traffic regime, right? Uh, the lambda and the D is independent of N. And also it's true for like the traditional mean field model or mean field limit where the dynamical system or the differential equation is, is N independent. There's no N there. So in this case, uh, we can show for large class of the mean field limit or mean field model, the rate of convergence is one over N. So as N increases, mean square root, converges as one of them. And uh, because the flexibility provided by Stan's method, as I mentioned, we can build the, the, the mean field model uh, with parameter n inside, right? So with that, we are able to analyze, for example, the heavy traffic regime under the power two choices, where the lambda actually approached to one as n increases. Uh, we are able to show, for example, the average Q length is roughly alpha log n, where the alpha is the heavy traffic parameter defines how fast this lambda curves to n. So, so the, the Q length is always order of log n and how fast or heavy the regime will affect this multiplicative constant alpha ahead of log n. Okay, so these are the, some new results we can establish. Uh, we kind of uh, use a similar idea uh, to understand the uh, uh, reinforcement learning algorithm, for example, particularly the TD learning algorithm, try to understand the finite uh, time performance. Uh, we also apply to the mean field game for wireless system. Uh, you will find the list of publication at the end. But these are the things we can do based on what I just said. Okay. Uh, I want to stop here for like one or two minutes just to uh, see whether there any question, then continue to the next topic make the mean field model even more, more strange, okay? Okay, so if not, uh, I know I have 15 minutes, so let me uh, get into the uh, last part of this talk. So if we look at the uh, mean, field, so mean field model so far and uh, look at how we apply Stan's method, right? What we are doing is we are building our uh, uh, ODE or dynamical system 
which directly connect to the uh, original stochastic system besides that, okay? The way we define the dynamical system is we define a stock equal to the conditional expedition or the, the conditional drift or just the drift, okay? And then uh, with that, use sense method, what we can establish is the error uh, between the steady state versus the fixed point of the mean field uh, is depends on Haitian and the uh, scaling parameter epsilon, which in most cases won't obey, okay? So what it requires, so what it requires, for example, to uh, build this mean field model is, first of all, your mean field model has to be accurate, right? So we are building this dynamical system or differential equation and in this way. So this S dot has to be accurate for every state S, okay? And the next, we want to understand the uh, convergence of my uh, ODE or dynamical system uh, to get the result we have related to the Haitian and so on, uh, we need to make sure the dynamical system is smooth. Uh, the gradient will exist. Uh, I think the uh, gradient has to also uh, be uh, Lipschitz as well. Okay, so that's smoothness condition we need to impose on the system. Okay, so these are all good. For example, if you look at the power D choices and uh, this is uh, ODE you will get, uh, everything's good. It's smooth, it's accurate uh, for every S. Okay. But on the other hand, uh, if you look at some other existing or well-known algorithm, even the very, very basic joint short is Q, uh, it creates a problem. The problem is uh, if you look at the dynamical system or the mean field for, for the joint short is Q, it's actually not smooth. The reason is if you do, do joint short is Q, the pack is going routed to the shortest Q, uh, you fill it up, then you put all the packets to the, to the now this, let's say you go to all the empty queues. Now there are no empty queues, go to all the queues with size one and all the queues with size two. So it's highly nonlinear and highly non-smooth, right? Even for this very simple joint short skew algorithm, you cannot actually use what I said earlier to understand the steady state, okay? Uh, so actually there's a, a Great efforts are uh, like from these papers, which try to understand the heavy traffic performance of joint short skew, especially in focus on like the steady state or trend in the Q lens. And uh, uh, the analysis are beautiful, but the analysis is very, very advanced. Okay, you require a lot of the uh, advanced tool to understand because of this uh, nonlinearity and uh, discontinuity of the differential equation. You will you'll find. So the, basically under the joint short skew, you continue like to make switches, right? Uh, even under the diffusion model, okay? So uh, what we want to uh, uh, look at is we try to see whether we can generalize, right? What I said for the mean field model combined stance method to make that even applicable to those kind of system you have highly, uh, which are highly nonlinear and even are uh, discontinuous, okay? What do we do, okay? And uh, the approach we come up with is, it turns out in many cases, you can uh, utilize state space concentration to overcome that. And uh, 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 a byproduct you will see is uh, actually with that, you can come up with some uh, mean field models you will see later, uh, you probably never thought about before, okay? Because it's so simple and it's so wrong, I would say so that way, okay? Okay, so uh, recall what is our goal. Our goal is uh, we have a stochastic system which will converge to steady state, and we have a, a ODE which converge to its uh, equilibrium point, and we want to show these two are, are close, right? Okay. Uh, let's say you have a two-dimensional picture; it's a cartoon, not come from real system. Uh, the the red dot or the orange dot is a fixed point of the stochastic system, and the blue area. Is where the steady state distribution, the typical steady state distribution will be. Okay, so if I know my uh, mean field model is accurate, then the steady state distribution uh, has to concentrate around that uh, uh, fixed point, right? Because otherwise, the approximation will not be accurate. Okay, so that's actually the very important observation, because if we look at those uh, system, let's say the system on the joint short is Q. What happens is uh, most of the cases are uh, the discontinuity and the uh, high nonlinearity occurs at the state space, which far away from the mean field model, uh, sorry, 
far away from the mean field uh, fixed point. Okay. Actually, uh, around that fixed point, usually the dynamic is pretty simple and smooth. Okay. So here is our idea is now how about we first utilize knowledge from the stochastic system so far, like from the beginning when we introduced the mean field until stance method and so on, we never touch the stochastic system or use that knowledge, right? We just define the mean field based on that. After that, all analysis is, is deterministic. So now we want to go back to the pre-limiting system to see we, whether we can extract more knowledge or more useful information from that. One thing we can extract that from is maybe we have state space concentration means at a steady state, the stochastic system actually live in that nice region where you have smooth or even linear mean field model, okay? And the probabilities go outside the region is very, very small. If that is true, then we can uh, divide our analysis into two parts. One part is uh, the part where S is outside that nice region, which will occur with low probability. And uh, the other part is this S will be within uh, that region where we have nice, simple uh, mean field model we can use to describe the system. Then we can apply Stan's method to quantify the approximation error. Okay, so that's, that's the idea. So let me, uh, uh, okay, so uh, now we already see the Stan's method part. How do we uh, prove like the state space concentration? Uh, what we utilize is the uh, geometric bound for the stationary distribution uh, related to Hayek's lemma. And, uh, but the version we use is the uh, Basimus, uh, Germanics, and Sisikis version in their 2001 paper. Uh, the key idea is very simple, is if you can find a Lyapunov function, right? Such that uh, the Lyapunov function, it will have negative drift outside certain region B. Okay, and uh, the drift is large enough. Let's say it's uh, linear proportional to epsilon. Then when you move further away from that uh, region B, then probability of that will become smaller and smaller. Okay, actually the probability will decays in most cases exponential. So with that, then we can uh, look into quantify which region the steady state will live into with, uh, with high probability. Okay, so here is a very simple example and related to joint shortest Q. Let's say uh, if we have a joint shortest Q and uh, each server only have one buffer, right? Even that is, is a highly, uh, it, it has like a discontinuity in the differential equation. But if you look at this system, you ask the system at a steady state, where the system gonna live to, right? So S1, uh, just quickly, S1 is the number of servers uh, with Q length at least one. So all busy servers. And S2 is the number of servers which has uh, Q length at least two. So at least one job is waiting, right? So busy server with one job is waiting. So if you look at uh, this two dimensional uh, state space, right? Uh, the triangle I listed here is the valid state space. So S2 has to be smaller than S1 because all busy servers are, I mean, all servers with job waiting will be busy servers, right? So it's in this two dimensional triangle, okay? But if you look at the system at a steady state, especially in the case when the traffic is really heavy, then you know uh, almost all the servers will be busy, which means you will not live in a region where Lambda is, is not even far away, is, is like a, have some gap between one, okay? Join short Q will continually push the system towards the right-hand side, make sure S1 is close to one, right? So that you can show with the state space concentration. Then if that happens, what can we, uh, how do we view the system? We can simply view the system as a single queue or single server system with arrival rate is lambda and the service rate is whatever the lower bound we can establish on the number or the fraction of busy servers. Here in that case would be lambda m plus square term log n, okay? So in that regime, uh, what differential equation can we use? We have lambda coming in. We have uh, lambda plus uh, some log n over n going out. So the dynamic of this uh, system, let's say S is the average Q length, is S dot equal to negative log n over squared n. Okay. So that's the mean field model we can use in that regime. So you can see why it's, it's strange because it's wrong, right? If you 
look at it, say, okay, this is my mean field model to approximate the uh, original system. Then in most of these state space, this equation is not true. It's only true in this very narrow space, uh, but it's very simple. And also the good news is your system, the JSQ system at a steady state will live in that region with high probability. Okay, so it's locally correct and that's why we can use it. Okay, and uh, that's that's already said. And uh, that actually allows us to uh, prove uh, a result we feel are uh, uh, like very exciting because now instead of like doing this analysis per algorithm, right? For JSQ, you have a mean field model, so I analyze JSQ. For power D, I have another mean field model, then I, I, I write another paper on that. With this approach, basically you can show is at a steady state, many of these well-defined algorithm will have similar performance around that fixed point of the mean field. And you can use just a single uh, mean field model, the one I listed there to analyze that, okay? And uh, that's unified analysis. And also uh, you can unify analysis to show the state space uh, concentration as well, okay? So with that, what we able to establish is a sufficient condition for them to achieve uh, asymptotic zero weighting. So every job come in will has high probability to be, to be a, a route to an idle server. And uh, that sufficient condition covers the JSQ, GIQ, power D choices, and, and so on. And furthermore, uh, we were able to analyze the performance uh, for the heavy traffic regime for alpha go from zero to one continuously, okay? Instead of looking at alpha, which is equal to zero, like it's uh, under loaded regime, alpha equal to 0.5, that's a hopping weight regime, or alpha equal to one, which is a critically loaded regime, a non-degenerated slowdown. Uh, we are able to analyze the performance for alpha, which is continuously go from zero to one, okay? And uh, what interesting is you actually have something uh, kind of like, like the phase, uh, uh, phase transition. When alpha is less than 0.5, what you can show is actually most of servers are busy and almost no server has waiting job. The number of waiting job, a uh, number of servers has waiting job on average is order one, remember, you have n servers, but uh, like less than one of them will, will have a waiting job, okay? And when alpha is between 0.5 and the one, then basically you have a two dimensional, or I mean, you, the state is like, or has two dimensions. One is the number of busy servers, right? It's close to lambda n. And the number of uh, servers which have a waiting job is roughly at the order of n alpha times log n, okay? And the number of uh, servers which has uh, two waiting job is, is almost negligible, the O1 versus, okay? And actually in analysis, uh, we have this log n because we use the state space concentration. Our conjecture was actually this log n really is not necessary. The scale should be like log n uh, for S1, uh, sorry, lambda n for, for S1 and uh, like uh, uh, an alpha for an S2, okay? That result actually was proven by, uh, sorry, by a paper by uh, Zhao and Banerjee and Mukherjee in, in their paper, they actually uh, proved that result. It's a very nice paper. I encourage you to read it, okay? And uh, furthermore, uh, we also able to go beyond the exponential service time and look at a general service time, like Coxian M service time. And then now the difficulty again is to show state space concentration. Uh, we use a technique we call iterative state space peeling. So instead of doing that one step, we continuously shrink the state space and uh, peel, peel it out. And we have an iterative way to do that. Then we, at the end, we show it again, we'll concentrate a very nice regime. We can use the simple mean field uh, equation to describe that. And we show again under similar, like under the uh, subwitting with, with uh, sub. For the case when alpha is less than 0.5, we again can achieve almost a zero, uh, uh, zero weighting. Uh, for that case as well, even if it's a general service time, okay? So our, these are the related papers. I think the slides are available. So if you're interested, you can look at these papers, uh, like some basic paper about mean field model or mean field approximation, uh, then our, the, our work on load balancing on reinforcement learning on large network. Uh, these are my collaborators. So Shin is the one which contributed uh, a lot to the 
uh, mean field uh, uh, stance method and mean field, and then load balancing uh, in cloud computing case. All the work about zero delay, uh, Xing, Xing is the main contributor, and Kang is the one who did the, uh, the Cochrane M distribution. Then Diraj and Srinivas, we work together using that to the world setting, and uh, Sri Kang and I uh, did the work on the reinforcement learning uh, problem. Okay, uh, I would like to thank all the uh, collaborators and all the uh, audience uh, for, for listening to this talk as well. And now uh, I'm ready to answer any question. Okay. Thanks, Yash. Thank you, Lee. Do we have any questions for Lee after that wonderful talk? Uh, I have uh, I have one question. Sure, yeah. Uh, sure? Hi, Lee. Uh, Hi, good to see you. Very nice talk. Uh, I was wondering about the last slide, uh, uh, the sub half inbit and the super half inbit result. Uh -huh. uh, so in some sense for sub half inbit, you get uh, uh, the tight result, but for the super half inbit, it's lose by a factor of log n. Is it because uh, the behavior is such that in the sub half inbit regime, your essentially your stochastic system is actually converging to a single point? But in the super half in which it's not. And then yeah. that's why this method would always be off by a certain factor when your stochastic system is not converging to a single point. Uh I think you you probably is correct, right? So uh, if it's a single point, then uh, you can show uh, the convergence and uh then if it's not uh, a single point, like if it involves distribution, I think the the problem like for us, why the log n appears is we're using the tail bound, right? The geometric tail. And to get the tail bound, to get the concentration, you always need a log in the exponent, right? To make the property right. small. So the log is always there. Yeah, so uh, of course the log, I think it's a limitation of just uh, establishing the tail bound. Because uh, in some sense analysis. you're, because in some sense you are comparing to a system which is deterministic, uh, but in super half and with the right system to co compare again should have like a non-trivial stochastic distribution. Because uh, mm -hmm. you're co co comparing it with like an ODE. Yeah, I'm not sure whether compared to like a SDE is necessary to get rid of this log. Uh, I still feel the limitation is mainly about just the tail bound part. Yeah, but but you could be right, right? Maybe if we look at that, that's what you mean, right? Instead of looking at the mean field fixed point at the limit, you look at the distribution at the limit, then you may be able to get rid of log. That, that's possible. Uh, just personally, I feel even with the deterministic fixed point, we there, there should be a way to get this log as well. But of course, I don't have a, definite answer just my feeling about that yeah. uh-huh okay. yeah okay uh, and then one more question was like you showed the steins ode and uh, the the classical uh, power of t ode for the mm -hmm. mean field uh, how are those two related like uh, can you come up with like a cost function for which the steins ode will be same as the the classical mean field ode yeah, so like in the uh, light traffic case, right? So if we say d equal to two, uh, lambda is some constant which is independent of n, then they are the same. Uh -huh, okay. Yeah, so what do we are like the ODE is uh, not directly related to a stance method. ODE is just the system you want to use to approximate the original system. That's why I think the, the advantage of your stance method or like the later state space uh, concentration is uh, give you the flexibility. You can use any ODE you want, as long as you think it's a good ODE, right? You don't uh -huh. have to verify, justify it's a limit. So, so therefore, right. it give you so many other choices to use. Okay, okay, okay. Good. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Hello. I have one more question. Yeah. Maybe. Sure. Yeah. Agent. Yeah. So yeah. So yeah. Very nice, nice talk. For so just a small question about this uh, idea of stay, uh, stay space concentration. So do you need to assume that the mean field has a unique stationary measure to begin with this? No. So the stay space concentration or is nothing to do with the mean field. It's looking into the steady state distribution of the stochastic system. Uh huh. 
So you don't, so there's only one unique one, right? You don't need to, ah, yeah, okay, I see, yeah. Yeah, so we just because... show like, uh, instead of the, uh, like living in the entire state space, it will live into a very small region uh, for the stochastic system. Uh, uh, Concentrating around concentrate, the state, right. state is, okay. But yeah, so you may not may or may not convert, uh, concentrate around the mean field fixed point, right? Uh, yeah. What you can do is you first show concentration, and then find a way to define a mean field model. Maybe the fixed point actually inside that region, so you can go okay. there, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I see. Uh, another thing I want to quickly mention is uh, why we call the concentration instead collapse because uh, it's not necessary you collapse from high dimensional to low dimensional space like in what happens in the heavy traffic analysis. It just shows the state space is smaller, right? So it's not necessary. You have a dimension reduction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank Thanks. Yash, you are muted. We are over time. So maybe we can close the official part of the talk here. So let's thank Lee. And then, uh, Lee, if you have a couple minutes, uh, you could stay on afterwards uh, in case people have questions. Do you, do you have a couple minutes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll stay on. Yeah, for, for uh, thank you. Yeah. And thank anyone, you. if you have a further question, uh, happy to chat more about it. Thanks. Thanks, Yash, again for inviting me. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'll stop sharing. Um, so I wanted to 